Well, Ted Huey is a former Hong Kong legislator who fled the city late last year. The exiled pro-democracy leader is now based in Adelaide and he joins me now. It's nice to have you with us. Can I go back to 1997 uh, and that mm -hmm. moment of the handover? I think you were about 15 years old at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've said that that really changed the course of your life. When did you become aware that things were significantly going to change? Only later when I'm uh, at my 20s. Because at my teenage, uh, people at that time, at the 90s, believed in uh, the CCP that it will change, that it will live up to its promises made in the basic law, that we will have democracy and freedom gradually. Was that naive? Because even at the time, and I was there reporting that, I recall talking to people who were sceptical that the, mm. the one country, two systems was really going to last for 50 years. Even Margaret Thatcher, in her memoirs, mm -hmm. raised concerns about that while she was cutting the deal with Beijing. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, returning Hong Kong to China meant that it would come under the control of the Chinese Communist Party. It's happened mm -hmm. sooner, but it was inevitable, wasn't it? Yeah, if, if you look back from now, people can all be naive from Hong Kong, but that's the only uh, acceptable choice for Hong Kongers because uh, we, we, want, we wanted freedom and democracy, and the only way is to accept China uh, as our country. But then uh, at my 20s, of course, uh, now uh, I gradually realized that, uh, that Beijing will not live up to its promise. And now it's been proven. Now all our freedoms are gone in months. Let's look at it um, from the other side, if we can. Um, the Chinese mm -hmm. Communist Party, Beijing, would be saying, well, why should Hong Kong have freedoms or rights or democracy that other parts of China do not? Um, they would say, and they do say, this is China. We make the laws mm -hmm. of China. Why should Hong Kong be different. What do you say to that fundamental question of China's sovereignty, mm -hmm. even though it may be breaking mm -hmm. the agreement, but, in, but saying this is our sovereign right? Yeah, but look, uh, over the, uh, the, the years after the handover, Hong Kongers never asked anything more than just freedom and democracy. We didn't ask for independence, only still recently by a very minority of people. But the, our mainstream uh, argument is that Freedom and democracy is a universal value, and it's a, it's, a, it's a promise that's been made to us. And for that promise, we agree to be part of China. So it's more like a, like a deal. Can you be right? just... But when you say be part of China, again, we come back to this, what does that mean? Is China ruled from Beijing by the Chinese Communist Party that imposes the laws that it sees fit? Um, isn't that what belonging to China means. I just go back to this to this first first point that yes, it's happened mm -hmm. way before the the fifty year period. But mm -hmm. if it, if Hong Kong is being handed back to China, it is being handed back to China, and the Chinese Communist Party will impose what it sees fit. The fact that we are handed back to China doesn't mean that China can do whatever it wants to us, because it's made its promise internationally and locally to its people, to international communities, and even uh, the promise made in international treaties registered in the UN. So it's not just a promise, a legal binding mm. uh, document, and it's a universal value. It's not about fairness that we have more freedom than other cities in China, because it's a universal value. And in fact, Hong Kong has better conditions to have freedom and democracy, because we have the rule of law, and we have an independent judiciary back at that time. So we, we have all the qualities and conditions, so why, why not? And we saw what that still means, that idea of a Hong Kong identity uh, with the protests over the you know, recent years, and we've seen the response mm -hmm. from Beijing. The Chinese Communist Party has often been described as a, a, a fragile party, that China is a fragile superpower. What is it, do you think, that scared, if I can use that phrase, or concerned the Chinese Communist Party about that show of defiance and those protests for democracy and the likes of yourself and others in Hong Kong. Yeah, I agree that uh, the regime in China, Beijing is very fragile, or it's very scared of its people because uh, it wants to make sure that it will stay in power forever because it's a one-party dictatorship. But in, in the democracy that Hong Kong people are after, we, we want to have our power back in the people so that we can vote, we can have a government that rep that's representative of us all. So China, Beijing is very 
very afraid of us. And now with Hong Kong identity uh, growing up, it's mm. only because uh, we, we feel like our self-identity as Hong Kongers is invaded now with uh, all the ideal, uh, ideal mm. ideologies uh, coming from China. So we need to protect our own identity as Hong Konger. Now, of course, you were heavily involved in the protests. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you were raising funds, you were organising the protests, mm. and you were doing this, I assume, in full knowledge that this is in contravention of the national security laws that Beijing was bringing down. Were you at that point saying, OK, this is an act of defiance and you were prepared for the consequences that would inevitably come? Um, half and half, because at the first half of the freedom movement in 2019, the national security law was mm. not in place. I felt it's only my responsibility to stand with the people and but to then, be a But then afterwards, when you continue, mm -hmm. continue that, were you saying, well, I know what is going to happen here? Yes, after that, I, I kind of know that uh, it's going to happen. But still, I don't think I will do uh, I, I would be betraying my people. Of course, I will be standing with, with the people uh, that we fought uh, all along. You've, you're facing nine charges um, in contravention of the national security laws. There's a, a money laundering charge as well. What would mm -hmm. happen if you went back to Hong Kong and faced those charges? Um, I would be in jail, thrown to jail, definitely, for... Uh, decades or for life because uh, there's life imprisonment for infringing the national security law. So there's no doubt about it. As long as uh, the moment I step in the border of Hong Kong, mm. I'll be in jail. Hong Kong's um, security secretary, John Lee, has said specifically that he mm. considers these actions um, that you will be responsible, criminally liable for life. That means that you will be pursued for the rest of your life. Does this mean that you now consider yourself to be a political refugee, that you can't go back home and you are looking for somewhere else as a haven? P politically, yes. Um, uh, I cannot go, go back home, and even I want to, even I miss home. So uh, I, I do need uh, some kind of protection from other nations. Uh, because I'll be deprived of uh, my personal safety and freedom if I go back home. Is this ultimately yes. what you'll be seeking here in Australia, that political asylum on the basis that you are not safe if you return to Hong Kong? That's the last thing that I want to do um, because uh, I, I want to be self-sustained. Of course, I don't, if, if that's, it's possible, I don't want protections. But if I need to stay in a country, a, a place, for a longer time so that I can do advocacy for Hong Kong's freedoms and democracies. I, I probably need that, but that's the last thing I want to do mm. because uh, I don't want to call another place home. Hong Kong is forever my home. Just a, a final thought from you. You and, and uh, some of your supporters are now uh, locked up. Others have left. You're here and you're unable, as you say, to return to Hong Kong. We've seen these new security laws. We've seen the banning of the Tiananmen protest. We've seen the stronger arm taken by Beijing and very mm. little response in terms of uh, a reaction from the rest of the world to this, even though there's been people have registered and other countries have registered their concerns. But mm -hmm. does this mean the battle is lost? You can't go back, people are locked up, the Chinese Communist Party is imposing its law that this battle is lost and this is the future of Hong Kong? We probably lost one battle, but the war is not over. So uh, I believe it's a, a long battle, long war. And for now, what we need to do is to save our power, save our energies and not to be thrown to jails. So we need to be more organized. We need to develop and to make our uh, diasporic community grow uh, outside Hong Kong. I believe that uh, one day uh, people will rise again with uh, international incidents and all the changes. People, of course, will, will be brave again and, and will rise and up. And what does this mean for people in Hong Kong now, the protesters, the students who are still there? Do, you, do they continue to take to the streets in defiance? What do they do? Uh, they don't. Now, uh, streets demonstrations and assemblies are totally banned. And people, what people do is spreading messages and uh, of freedom and democracy from virtually on the internet, social media, mm. and of course, like the candlelight vigils, uh, mourning for 
uh, Tiananmen massacres. They still do that, but they don't go to the Victoria Park in Hong Kong because that's banned, mm -hmm. but they do it in other parts of the streets. I, I can see the spirit still there and uh, people are still willing to fight, but of course in another format nowadays. Tedway, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you again for giving us your time. Thank you.